Hello, everyone. I'd like to read a few verses in Mark 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now Jesus is telling us here that we have a commission. We have an obligation to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, in preaching the gospel, obviously it's the salvation plan of God, the good news that people can be saved. But within preaching the gospel, people need to know what, what they're being saved from. Well, it's the wrath of God, eternal damnation. And why will a person receive eternal damnation or uh, be a recipient of the wrath of God? And that is where we get into the sin issue and the stain, the blot of sin that comes upon every man since Adam and how only one man can erase that, diffuse that condemnation, and that's Jesus Christ. So preaching the good news is not just telling them about John 3.16. It's not just about that. It's telling them why they need to receive salvation. Uh, people need to know what they're being saved from, why they need salvation. To every creature, no one is exempt. People say at times to us, why are you here? What is your purpose for being here today? Jesus has commanded us to preach the gospel to every creature, and you certainly are a creature here at this parade, this festival. So Mark 16, 15 tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now people say, well, this just means that you must believe to be saved. And if you don't believe, you'll be damned. Well, apparently they're missing a, a key word here. And he that believeth and is baptized. I am of the belief that if a person is a true believer, that God will not allow them to leave this planet until they get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. He will not allow one of his sheep to be lost. He will keep all that the Father has given him. They say, well, we don't believe baptism is necessary and essential. Okay, you don't have to believe it. But the Bible tells us here, Jesus says, he that believeth not shall be damned. And this is a, a dual type of unbelief in this scripture. It's unbelief of the gospel. The people don't believe the gospel, they're going to be damned. And it's also those who are professing Christians who do not believe that baptism is essential. So they say, John 3, 16 only, belief in the gospel only. Baptism is just an outward sign of an inward change. That doesn't exist, that term in the Bible, but they use it anyways. They invented it. Or it's merely symbolic. You can do it if you want to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. It's an outward show. It's for the people. It's for the public, for them to congratulate you and give you a round of applause. And Listen, that's not true. Those are all lies. And take a look at the Ethiopian eunuch. He didn't have a crowd there to congratulate him at his baptism. Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized right now? And Philip baptized him in the name of Jesus Christ, and he disappeared. His, his only audience member disappeared. <laughs> so you say it's for an outward show for the public to be entertained? It's merely symbolic? Those are lies. He that believeth not shall be damned. Many so-called preachers and teachers and even street preachers who go around saying, oh, baptism is not essential. Believe, in, uh, believe the gospel and be saved. Believe the gospel and be saved. They don't bring things into context. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. They're not preaching repentance and remission of sins. Jesus said, and you shall preach repentance and remission of sins beginning at Jerusalem. Not just repentance, but also remission of sins. Well, how do we get our sins remitted? Read Acts 2.38. Read Acts 2.38. And also what Ananias told Saul, Paul, Arise, why tarriest thou? Be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? Is the name of the Lord Father? Or is that a title? Is the name of the Lord Holy Spirit? Or is that a title of the Spirit? Is the name of the Lord's Son? 
or is that a title of the only begotten? What is the name of the Lord? Read Acts 4.12. Read Colossians 3.17 to get your answer. The name of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. These signs shall follow them that believe. That believe. There are times when we have to cast out devils. Now I'm not talking about telling people fire, 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 come out of the belly, fire, fire. And listen, there are many people who are who are playing games, who are seeking to draw, you know, a, a following uh, through entertainment. I'm talking about really casting out a devil. Have you really seen a spirit leave a body? And we're not talking about people calling in Zoom and, and going through 30 minutes of coughing up and spitting out and, you know, vomiting, so-called vomiting or dry coughing, dry heaving in, in, a, in a wastebasket. And then all of a sudden say, oh, I feel better now. Thank you. I mean, demons don't go to a exorcist and say, I need you to cast this demon out of me. Here it goes. It's coming right now. <laughs> If you come across a situation where a spirit has overtaken a person and you are led through the spirit to cast it out, you have the ability to cast out that demon. They shall speak with new tongues. Now, people say, well, this just means that, you know, you're going to have a better way of speaking about you as a Christian. Well, that should be the case. However, there are many professing Christians who have foul mouths, who, who curse, who speak in a perverted manner, who, who use foul speech, perverted speech. They're going to be condemned. Their words will condemn them. This really means speaking with new tongues. Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. He said, I sing in the spirit sing in tongues. I sing in the understanding also, sing in tongues. Jude said, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That means praying in tongues. Uh, it's a tongue that's unknown to you, foreign to you. You don't know if you're speaking in an unknown tongue like a foreign language or a tongue of angels. You're speaking in a new tongue, unless there be an interpreter for the edification of the church. But if there's no interpreter, then you speak to God and to yourself. The Bible says you can pray in the spirit. You can pray in the understanding also. You have prayer time in tongues. You build up your most holy faith, speaking in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. So, yes, these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, like, like we said in the last verse, those that believe not shall be damned. There are those who say, well, you don't need to speak in new tongues. You don't need the Holy Ghost baptism. It's unnecessary. Well, we know what's going to happen to those folk. Mark 16, 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, these are signs that follow the believers. We see the Apostle Paul. He was uh, putting his hands near a campfire, and he was stung by a serpent, and he was able to shake it off, and he was well. He didn't die. He, nothing happened to him where he got sick and diseased. He was able to shake it off, and uh, he proceeded forward with the mission that God called him to. So that can take place if that happens upon a believer, if they drink any daily thing. And we're not saying on purpose. You know, there are people who call themselves Christians who take up serpents and handle them in an attempting way towards God. And the Bible says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. These, these serpent handlers that go into churches and pray around with serpents, many of them get stung, Okay because they're tempting God. That's not what it's referring to here. If they drink any deadly thing, and who knows how often that has probably happened to us, and we're still here as believers. So they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, we thank God for this, because this is something that we put into practice in the ministry, in the family, uh, in the church. We lay hands on those who are sick, and hands have been laid upon us when we were sick. And thank God for recovery. If it's your time, it's your time. That's God's business, right? But if there's the possibility for recovery and healing, then we go through this process, this motion, 
and this instruction of the scriptures, we lay hands upon each other that, that need to be healed, and we pray for healing, and they shall recover if it's God's will. Verse 19, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Now what does this mean, sat on the right hand of God? Well, we know now that the right hand of God is, is a position of power and authority. We know that the Bible tells us that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, the disciples were, were curious as to what they seen walking on the water, and they said, uh, we thought it was a spirit. And Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones. Okay, so God is a spirit that hath not flesh and bones only when he is embodying his son will he have flesh and bones in the manifestation of his son uh, he's the express image of god jesus christ okay he's a bodily representation of god jesus christ if you see jesus you see god if you see god you see jesus when you see god you will see jesus christ sitting one throne in heaven and who is seated upon the throne Jesus Christ, God. Jesus sat on the right hand of God. He's at his power. He also says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, all power has been given unto me. Given. That came from God to the Son. Praise the Lord. So this is just a brief uh, overview of the last few verses in Mark chapter 16 because uh, there has been debate whether or not they should be included and whether they should be received. But we receive everything that's in this KJV. That's what we read. That's what we believe. Uh, we don't take any anything away from it. We don't add to it. We don't dismiss it. We don't say, oh, this Mark chapter 16 shouldn't have been in there. Uh, other verses in, in John, First John. No, everything is to be included that we can read. God has preserved his word and it, and it can be rightly divided. Uh, by a person who can rightly divide the word of truth, who's not there with an agenda to add to it or take away from it, not promote a denomination or a certain uh, theory of belief, but someone who stays true to the word of God. They will be able to rightly divide it, as we have just done here, the last few verses of Mark chapter 16. Until next time.